talk today, my name, I'm Brendan McAdams, by the way, for those who haven't met me. I work for the professional services group at TypeSafe. So I actually spend a lot of my day, rather than writing code, helping other people write code, which is a, an interesting way to change your perspective, especially with Scala. Um, I've spent a lot of time over the last year learning a lot about how not to write code by watching other people write code that they shouldn't write. Uh, prior to that, prior to December when I joined TypeSafe, I spent about two and a half years writing MongoDB drivers in Scala and in Java, and I learned a lot about what was wrong with the way we do networking. A great example being there's this huge push in the Scala community, even in the Java community, to go to asynchronous web frameworks. And yet 90% of the people who are doing that are using database drivers that are blocking. And, it, and they don't understand why it's bad that they're blocking because the threads that can be reused in an asynchronous framework can't be reused when there's something blocking under the covers. And so I've been doing a lot of work over the last two years playing with an idea that I think I'm finally getting done of writing a MongoDB driver that's purely asynchronous and I've recently moved it over to this new Aka IO layer. So I want to talk about the new Aka IO, which I look at as network IO for more civilized age, but also a little bit about what the other options for doing IO are so you understand why we're going to the point that we're going. So to start with is, the question is, the new Aka I.O., because that new moniker meaning something, not just it's new, new, but there was another I.O. layer in Aka. It's been there since 2.0. Some of the heritage of that has been carried over the new one, but we have deprecated the old APIs. The biggest thing is that with Aka 2.2, which was released in July, there was a new I.O. layer introduced that was actually a collaboration with the Spray team. And this is huge because Spray's performance is just off the charts. And they've done a lot of work internally to write raw network code and write a library for very, very high performance networking that's now been introduced into Aka that can be used to write your own stuff. And if you want, there's a link at the bottom of my slides, which I'll post later, the, to the Spray benchmarks to get an idea of just how fast they are, and especially compared to other web frameworks for the JVM and off the JVM. The performance is really impressive. For those who don't know, Spray is actually going to be merged into Aka over the next few months and eventually will become Aka HTTP. So there's sort of this continuous merger going on of taking these great ideas from Spray and bringing them in. The biggest thing is that it's a highly scalable and pipeline-based I.O. It's integrated into the after system, and we'll see what we mean by pipeline-based I.O. as we go through this. We'll talk about a couple things here. Why non-blocking I.O.? At least a quick refresher for those who are familiar or for those who aren't familiar about why we want non-blocking I.O. How it works, why it's advantageous over other ways to do things. How we represent network data in Aka I.O. How we would build a quick TCP client in Aka I.O. That's the basics of doing I.O. with Aka as well as using the pipeline system. So we can do things like very easily add SSL to an existing code base or add back pressure support. And then finally, a couple of closing thoughts on making these, uh, those, these APIs composable. So why not blocking I.O.? This is roughly what a traditional blocking I.O. model looks like where each of these circles is a thread that's attempting to get something from the network. And in this case, each thread is blocking, which means that it's polling the kernel, is there data yet, is there data yet, is there data yet, repeatedly. And it's blocking that thread from being able to be used from anything else and blocking up our ability to really context switch on the kernel. Because all we do when we context switch is put another thread on that's just polling and blocking that CPU from any other usage. And it looks a lot like this. Lots of beach balls, all blocking up the kernel. And the biggest thing is that each thread blocks on the network I.O. It means one thread can complete one task at a time and no more. And this makes Paul Ryan very sad. <laughs> so non-blocking I.O. makes this kernel polling a bit sinner. In this case, these boxes now represent tasks, because as soon as we move away from a thread per task, we can have a pool of threads behind them, and we can have multiple tasks operating where there might be three threads and 300 tasks. Because at the bottom here, we have a selector thread who is actually checking for all of these tasks, whether there's network data available and notifying them. And 
this is a thread, but it's much more efficient because there's only one person blocking. The other benefit that we actually get here is that our tasks are decoupled from threads, which means that we might have one thread processing three or four or five things. Because when we get to the equivalent of blocking, we, go to, we move that task off until the data comes back and we process something else. This is how we can scale our web applications by handling multiple users on one HTTP connection. Because when we go out to the database, we can just switch off and do something else. So with the tools that are out there, NIO was introduced in Java 1.4. The good things, obviously, before this, there was no non-blocking I.O. on the JVM. It's fast and powerful. And it acts as the underpinnings for anything else that does non-blocking I.O. on the JVM. It relies on NIO because it's the only way to interface these non-blocking things. Because there is coordination that goes with the kernel. To do things like the polling on selectors needs kernel modules for your operating system that can do it. So NIO is your underpinnings. The bad part is it's very esoteric and very low level. Doing things like working with the selector thread not only means you have to notify the selector thread that you're interested in events like the socket is available to read or the socket is available to write, but after you get notified that event is happened, you have to make sure to unregister or you'll keep getting spammed with the same event. There's a lot of esoteric code that has to happen doing raw NIO which is one of the reasons why a lot of people don't do raw NIO. The really big alternative in the JVM world is Netty. Um, there's also Apache Nina, which not a lot of people use, but has a lot of similar goals and similar limitations to Netty. This is really powerful. It's got a lot of rich APIs. It sits on top of NIO, but it makes it easy to work with. We get pipelines and other tools, but the bad part is it's a Java API. It's really tiresome and unwieldy to use from Scala. I did a previous version of my async driver on Netty, and I've spent most of my time writing code to just make it easy to work with these Java APIs. And what comes with that is a lot of mutability. There's a lot going on internally that's mutable that doesn't fit in the way that we want to write our Scala code. And this also comes with a lot of thread pools that you can't manage. If you're trying to have fine-grained concurrency control, you're not going to get that with Netty. It's simply not going to happen. And that, that said, Netty is a fine product, but it doesn't necessarily fit in the way we want to do things in Akka. So when we move over to Akka I.O., we need to keep in mind that there's another data structure from NIO that we'll often see, which is the byte buffer. And there's a really good link here to a, a blog by Katie Gregory where he writes up how to do things with byte buffers down to a, a fine grain level that's worth reading if you're interested. Working with raw arrays of bytes pretty much suck. If you've ever done that, and I do a lot of fine grain network management with arrays of bytes, and this is especially for larger than byte operations. A larger than byte operation means reading multiple bytes that represent a data structure like an int or a string. So, by a show of hands, how many people here know how to decode an int64 from a raw byte array? I'm not surprised Eric is the only one raising his hand and Tom is sort of raising his hand. How about doubles? Because those are even harder. And most importantly, what about if it's big endian versus little endian? Because this is complex too, because you have to read doubles, I believe, you have to read part in one order and then another part in another order. And these are esoteric and painful. And the Mongo Java driver actually does all of this by hand and it was really painful because they weren't using an IO. So the fact is that doing these is non-trivial, and it should be. Byte buffer gives you a bunch of simple operations for doing things. There's a get long, a get double, etc. And if you want big endian versus little endian, you can call order and pass it an instance of byte order, either little endian or big endian, and that changes the way that it will do the reads internally. So this makes things easier for you. It's a really good step on simplifying the way we do things on the JVM. Now, Akka I.O. introduces an even better way to do things that fits into our scholar world, known as Akka I.O.'s byte strip. This is, this is because mutable data structures are sort of the curse of working with Java APIs. We want to avoid them. So byte string is a immutable structure that can have byte buffers or arrays of bytes under it for manipulating network data. It's really just an index seek of bytes. There's no byte aware read or write operations directly on byte string. Instead, we break it out. So if you want to read, you 
you get a byte iterator via the iterator call. And this gives you ops like get double and get long. And it's a moving view over your data, so you don't have to call indices like you do with byte buffer. You simply, it moves as you do things like get long, get double. So it keeps going over things. And there's a bonus, which is that the Java I know byte order is passed implicitly on these calls. You don't have to change the order of your app. So there are places, for example, in the MongoDB wire protocol, where despite it being big endian, there are a couple, I'm sorry, little endian, there are a couple of places where it's actually encoded in big endian. So you have to switch back and forth. And it actually helps to just be able to say, go read this in big endian order. If you want to write, we fit into the Scala collection guidelines, which is that you get an instance of builder. You say byte string dot new builder, and you get a byte string builder with write operations. This is the converse of byte iterator. So you have put long, put string, put short. So let's create a hypothetical protocol, a very simple one. Um, we're going to write a time protocol. And incidentally, it's little endian, which makes things easier. Keep in mind, Java by default works in big endian because Sun historically made big endian processors. But Intel, which is pretty much the dominant processor at this point, is all little endian. So we have a client, and it has a very simple thing. The client message is just a message type to short zero, which is the indicator in our protocol for get time. And then our server is going to have message type one, which is set time. And this includes a long, which is a Unix timestamp, and a string for the time zone. We're going to encode and decode these very quickly off the network wire. So to write the client protocol message, we have a byte string builder here, we just say put short of zero, and that's it. We've written our single item on the protocol, and then result will give us back the byte string that we need, and we can carry on to pass them into the network or whatever else we need. I've also got a case object here, which extends a base time message trait that represents when we pass this message inside our app, and we want to say, I'd like to get the time, we'll use this case object as our internal protocol before it's encoded to this byte. Now, parsing the server reply, we get our data frame for the network, which is represented as a byte string. We ask for the iterator, and then we can say, like, get short, which implicitly pulls in the byte order. We get long for the timestamp, and we get string for the time zone. And then we have a companion class that goes with this. So we're decoding things much easier, and it's sort of a functional manner where it just fits in what we're doing. Our window keeps sliding over this information. Now, keep in mind as well, a byte string is actually a row. It can prevent a view over multiple underlying arrays of bytes or byte buffers. The downside, of course, with ropes in this situation is memory locality. Your view may be spread out across two or three or four gigs of heap, where your pieces of the rope are spread out all over the place, which can give you latency as you hop around RAM to find your data. Byte string can be compacted, so compact will return a new byte string with one memory contiguous byte array to make it much more efficient to work with. But it's not a cheap operation necessarily, so you have to keep that in mind. If you're going to do it, you better mean that you need compact and yield benefits. And these compact will tell us if the byte string is compacted or not. So how do we compose network clients in Aka.io? The biggest thing is that Aka.io provides a manager for work. It's the I.O. actors. This means that rather than invoking methods, we're going to communicate with the I.O. manager via message passing, just like we do with any other actor. It also means that our core code has to be an actor to do the communication. So generally, you access the actor for individual protocols, TCP, UDP, etc., via an ARC extension singleton called I.O. So you say I.O. and pass it TCP or UDP, and it will give you back the actor that's centrally responsible for managing I.O. with that protocol. It's actually very easy to wire your own protocol. So if you didn't want to write this in raw code, you could do it. Uh, Spray, for example, in 1.2 has a protocol that's called HTTP, which actually, instead of you having to speak HTTP on top of the TCP layer, they do that for you internally. So this is a roughly simple TCP coding with Aka.io, and I'm going to move to highlight this code so you don't have to all read it at once. Uh, I've done a couple of imports, like I've imported I.O. is I.O. facade just because it's easier for me to represent it than seeing it as I.O. So we have our TCP manager and we send a message called connect. Sorry. The TCP manager is here. I just instantiate I.O. TCP. 
the TCP manager, we send it a connect message, which is built into the TCP protocol, with the address we want, which is an INET socket address, and a list of options like keep alive, TCP no delay, etc., which come from the uh, Java sockets. Now, in our receive loop for ACA behavior, if we get a command fail with type connect, that tells us that our network connection failed. In this case, I'm responding by shutting the actor down and just saying, you know, there's an error. In the case where we get connected back, we can swap our ACA behavior. So in ACA, for those not familiar with it, you can change the receive loop at runtime. You can say, instead of handling things this way, I want you to now use this block of code. And so we don't have the code wired up to handle what would happen when we're connected to the socket by default. We swap over that when we're ready. And in this case, the sender that we got the message from is our now created actor that's managing that connection specifically. So we pass him as a parameter to the connected behavior, set him up and ready to go for here's your new socket to work with. Now, our connected behavior takes an argument of an actor ref, because that's our a remote actor that handles this stuff. And it's a receive loop. Again, it's an actor behavior that we simply changed over to using the call. So any message from outside our actor, this is a, maybe you, whoever's got an instance of our actor internally says, I want to get the time for the remote server. They send our get time message in. And we send to the connection an instance of tcp.command. That's a wrapper that tells the TCP driver you want to send this byte string. The downside here is that we have to do the encoding of the byte string directly in this code. We say, you know, get, get time dot two byte string to use that code we wrote earlier. We will get back a tcp.event, which contains a byte string represented here in data. And we can parse that back out to a set time object and forward that on however we've wired up our callbacks. So we're still dealing with the raw byte strings at this level of the code, but there is a better way to do it. If we want to separate things like parsing logic from our network handler, there are some options for doing this in Akaia. And this is pipeline. There sure, are better, saner, and awesomer ways to do it, although Kino kept telling me awesomer is not a valid word. I disagree. Um, simple is good, but simply complex is better. Think about that. You have complexity, but you've made it simple. You've abstracted over it. So with our existing implementation, a lot of our code is collated and potentially complex. The wire protocol decoding is mixed with core logic. It makes it a little hard for us to reason what we're doing. So if we want to decouple our wire protocol, or add us to cell support, or handle back pressure, we can do these with Aka IO's pipelines, which give us a way to register stages of encoding and decoding and add complex network handling downstream from our core actor. We can say, you know, I want to do these things, but I want them separate. It's separation of concerns. Most of the changes happen once our connection is established. Now, this is important to mention. You saw this already from the last slide, but commands go from our code to the remote end. And events come from the remote to our code. This is consistent across Lock.io. Commands go out, events come in, whether you're writing a server or a client. Now, setting up a pipeline, I've made a couple changes to my connected block. The first of which is now I create an instance of a TCP pipeline handler. And what goes into this is you'll notice there's two things here that are mixed together with what Jason called, uh, what did Jason call it earlier? He used the term. The chevron is what we call this, uh, this argument. So this double greater than composes multiple stages together to create a stage instance that can be handled in the pipeline handler. And these are now things that feed from one piece to the next when you put messages into them. So we've got an instance of pipeline. Now, we need to create an actor of a TCP pipeline handler, which we've instantiated with our new pipeline with our remote connection and with a copy of ourselves. And as well, in Faraka, I have deployed it with deploy, deploy local to make sure that it can't be popped on a remote VM accidentally because I'm already dealing with the network here. We also set up a death watch system, so we want to get notifications that that pipeline handler is terminated. So now we're not going to talk to our sender anymore, that raw TCP connection. We're going to send things through the pipeline handler. 
There's one other thing that has to happen. We could talk directly to our pipeline handler without doing this, and messages going out would get converted. But if we don't register our pipeline with our socket, messages coming in won't get translated using this pipeline. We've offloaded our protocol into another piece of code. So we send the set to the connection instance of TCP register with that pipeline that we created. And we now switch our context again. We also have to pass our pipeline in because there are command and event objects on pipeline that can speak in our message protocol now that we need to still use to signal to the system that we want to send a message out or that we're getting a message back. Now we need to update our connected behavior to speak only case classes. So this pipeline you'll see is actually an instance of something called a NIT, which has a with and after context. And then what's the command message and what's the, what's the event message at this level of code? So they're both instances of time message. And our get time code is now just saying send to the connection pipeline.command. We're not converting it to a byte string anymore. We're simply saying here's our event, our get time message. And it will be transcoded downstream into a byte string, but separated from this business logic code. And the same thing for getting back a set time. We simply get an event of pipeline.event, which contains a set time instance that we don't have to code. So our protocol handler, I'm going to look at this very briefly, because I don't want to get bogged down in this. I'm happy to go through this tomorrow if people want a more in-depth look at how these things work. Um, what we've got here is an instance of what's called a symmetric pipeline state. What that means is that commands going out and events going coming in are going to be translated between the same types. On the left side, we want time messages, and on the left, right side, we want our byte strings. And so we've got a command pipeline that says when you get a time message, convert it to a byte string, and when you get a byte string, convert it to a time message. So pipelines compose, and this is where it gets interesting. If I want to add SSL support to this protocol, all I have to do is bind with this Chevron operator, say add another stage, which is the SSL TLS support. And now automatically when I send a message out, it gets written with SSL, and when a message comes in, it gets converted from SSL into raw bytes. I don't have to think about it or worry about this. This is a huge step when you're trying to build clients where you want transparent SSL support if it's enabled. Mongo, for example, has optional SSL support. So I'd be able to wire into my client very simply. If you pass true to SSL when you create the actor, mix in the SSL support piece. And everything else in my code is the same because I don't have to care about the SSL. And this is all handled in that pipeline transparently. Now, network back pressure is an interesting problem because it can cause a lot of issues with people who don't understand it and don't wire that into their network logic. Downstream of any client network code, there are buffers in your kernel that are waiting to write messages to the network. They're not bottomless. If they get congested, if there's network congestion or for some reason they haven't been written out, you can hit a point where you get a buffer overflow. You can get an exception when writing to your local network because the buffers haven't cleared out enough. If your code isn't aware of this concept of congestion and able to handle it, you could have your whole client crash because it's getting these network socket errors. The answer typically is to handle back pressure. Be aware of the congestion and back off for a while when your buffers are full until they clear out to write more data. This is actually provided with Aka IO. There's a pre-rolled pipeline handler for back pressure. It makes it pretty easy to do. So we mix in a stash attribute. Stash is a special attribute that comes with actors that says, I may want to get messages off the mailbox, but then put them into a queue that says I'm going to handle them later. Think about it. If I haven't connected to the network yet, messages like get time I can't handle. But actor messages come in in a queue that I can pull one message at a time. So I can stash that message and say, I'll put that on the network as soon as we connect. So stash enables the stash behavior. In pipeline, we've now mixed in back pressure buffer. We set our low threshold, our high threshold, and the maximum number of bytes that can go through. 
And now we'll get signals from the back pressure buffer when it's at a high water mark or at a low water mark. A high water mark means you need to back off for a while, low water mark means you don't need to back off anymore. So our connected behavior, we've added one handler, which is the back pressure buffer high water mark reach. And all we do when we get that is switch our after behavior to say you're going to change how you respond to messages. The only message you're going to handle is going to be the low water mark. And so when we get any message other than low water mark, we call stash, which puts it in an internal queue that can be used later. When we get a low water mark reach message, we unstash all messages, which pops them into the mailbox, and we switch back to our connected behavior. So suddenly we've built a very flexible client that can handle back pressure without a lot of code, just using the internal actor mechanism to switch our behavior. And we're still immutable, which is wonderful. We're not changing a var or something else. Now, a couple of closing thoughts for composable APIs, because not all this stuff is easy. Obviously, writing an API that's purely actor-based isn't always going to work, and that's been one of the things I've had to deal with, for example, in the Mongo client, which is I don't necessarily want to communicate with actors. I want an interface that feels a little more functional. So a couple of conclusions that I've come up with. In SIP 14, the futures API, there's actually promises. And what promises are is they give you an object that contains a future. And you can create a promise and then return the future within it. And with the promise API, what you can do is you can say complete it. You can call complete it on the promise, which fills in the result for the future on the other side. So right there, you've got a tool for building sort of a functional API that hides the actors by simply setting up futures that you complete when they're available. And this is an easy way to handle a lot of the issues because it's asynchronous. Everything should be talked about in terms of futures. This is a pretty good model for what I think of as dispatching, where you have a hash map internally. You track request IDs. Most protocols that are complex will have a request ID from the client to the server, and the server will respond with, this is in response to request X. And then you simply dispatch it by completing the promise with whatever data you've got. Now, what do you do when you deal with large buffers of data? A great example is a database cursor. You get a whole bunch of items that need to be handled as an iterator would be the traditional way you handle them in Scala code or Java code. The two things that I've sort of come to think are the right way to do this is one is iterates. They're very powerful and they're very flexible, but they're potentially really hard for users to comprehend. They're not easy to just jump into. The other would be reactive streams, and these are becoming popular lately. Um, in particular, I've been looking a lot at Netflix's RX Java. They've got a Scala binding, and I've been playing with this as sort of my way to go forward. Is with reactive streams, they sort of look like a stream that you register to say, I want to be subscribed. And I want you to invoke me when there's another item available. So now things like cursors, where you have to buffer up and call the server for more, can be very transparent. And you can get notified when there's an error, and you can get notified when the stream is closed because there's no more data. And these work really well. Uh, the Netflix stuff in particular is really slick. It's a translation of the Rx stuff from uh, .NET. So these give you a lot of the power of iterate, but a much more friendly interface because you subscribe. You say, I want to subscribe to events. Here's my handler for what happens when there's another event. Here's what to do when there's an error. And here's what to do when it's completed. And from that point forward, everything is pushed into your code as items become available. And including things like we need to close or there's an error and you need to be aware of it. So that is all that I have for today. I am happy to take questions if people have them. And the uh, ACA.io is the direct site for the ACA project. Um, Letitcrash.com, I think we're decommissioning it and moving everything to the TypeSafe blog, but that's got a lot of back posts about ACA.io and other things. That's the ACA team blog. And obviously, TypeSafe.com is for TypeSafe. We do a lot of support, training, and consulting services. So if those of you working with Scala who need additional help or need training or anything else, we, you know, this is what we do. This is what I run around doing all day. Questions? Yes? Um, in some of those 
after show distractions, but very interesting, and you present that in the context of this custom protocol. Is there any way of servicing that uh, to just dealing with messages between two actor systems that are removing? I'm not sure offhand. I know one of the things that's happened is that we're moving the Aqua remoting protocol from Netty to Aqua.io. So I don't know that there's a way to do it right now, but I would suspect that in the future that would be something that's handled. Because it is important. You've got to be able to be aware that your remote system can, can receive. Now there is some buffering that happens internally to Aqua because, because of the way that Aqua works, we don't just blindly send a message to the remote mailbox. We need to confirm that it's come in. So there is a level of acknowledgement. And an acknowledgement protocol is another way of handling back pressure, where you acknowledge back to the sender that it's been enqueued and then you can carry on. So there's some level of back pressure that happens internally just for that aspect. So in your um, serialization example where you deserialize strings, I was just wondering, there's a bunch of different ways to represent strings on the network wire, obviously. Um, does, how does um, Aka.io deal with that? Does it have many different mechanisms, like for null terminated versus like where you know the length of Aka.io Aka uses the byte buffer implementation, which is just UTF-8 strings. So the Mongo wire protocol, for example, has both UTF-8 strings as well as what they call C strings, which null terminate. In which case you have to write your own implementation. I have an implementation somewhere of doing that. It's not too bad. You just have to pull the length header and then read the determination. Now, in the uh, transfer and SSL example, do you know how hard it would be to implement sort of a start TLS concept where the, the, the commands to, to that the client is requesting a transition into it, TLS comes in, in clear text and then it switches? I don't know if it's been a while since I've played with this protocol. So I know the SSL implementation has TLS, and I don't know how much that differs from Star TLS. But it, it should be pretty easy because it's really just it's very simple. I mean, if you look at the symmetric pipeline stuff, yeah. it's very similar to this. The symmetric pipeline stage, that's all it's implemented as. So you could pretty easily probably write a component that when it receives a certain message, instead of passing it on, starts that SSL protocol and, and finishes it. Other questions? Yes. I don't actually know. That's a good question. I don't think so, but it would probably be a good template to create. And I will look into that. So I think, you know, making this easy, especially the sample code, I, I'm still working on it. I'm going to put this up in a GitHub repo this week where it's a, a fully built project with both the client and the server. I'm still, I've got to make a couple of tweaks. But I could probably look at creating that as an activator template. A good model for how to do this. One more question? Yes? Uh, so far, this is all been about network IO. Um, are there plans to cover the disk IO stuff from the IO? I don't know. I mean, obviously we could do it, but I don't know that that's something that a lot of people are doing from the ACA standpoint where disk IO comes into play. I mean, NIO has support for disk IO and memory buffering and memory mapping and other things. I don't know how much demand there is for that. And I think that drives a lot of this stuff. Obviously, Spray hasn't had a need to buffer the disk or anything else, which meant their protocol was written purely for networking. But you could, you know, a lot of cases, if I recall correctly, when you deal with writing the disk from NIO, you use byte buffers, and you can wrap the byte buffer in byte string. You simply use the apply method and give it one or more byte buffers, and you get a byte, a byte string back that you can use to do your writes. I think there's at least send file in the spread. Right? Maybe. Which, but that goes over the network rather than on disk. But it reads a file. That's true. Okay. So I'm not sure how they're doing that. I don't know that translated over all. Well, send yeah. files. Mm -hmm. Last question. Do you think it's stashing it into a queue instead of on the queue or unbound the queue? I think it's unbounded by default. I'd have to double check. I, I believe it's unbounded. Let's take a quick look. Uh, Rich Hickey's shaking his fist at you. Who is? Rich Hickey. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, he sat in my slick talk at Philly ETU. I felt very self conscious. <laughs> Let's double check this so that I give you the right answer. It's unbounded by default. You can change that, though. 
we probably should, because the one issue with using Stash is that it's not persistent. So even if you're using something like event source or Aka persistence, if your Aka actor crashes, your Stash will disappear. So it needs to be used sparingly, and this is a great example of where it can be used appropriately, because you're buffering messages that need to go over the network. They're not something that's going to be queued up and stored to disk. If they go away, they'll be replayed from somewhere else. Great. Well, thank you very much, guys.